friends, Heidi here from Rain Country Homestead. God is good all the time. And today I want to talk about a couple of things. And number one is the importance of keeping a garden notebook. As you can see, my garden notebook is very, very simple. If you're one of those people that like kind of fancy schmancy pretty things, then go get yourself a fancy schmancy notebook. And it just has to be something that has plain paper in it. And I prefer college ruled paper because I need lines. Otherwise I'll, yeah, I do one of these things where I write at an angle. Um, so your garden notebook is going to be a very valuable resource to you through the years. Not just for the current year that you're working on, but for next year and the year after. Be, especially if you're a new gardener and, uh, or even if you've been gardening for a long time, you're trying something new. And you, you, what you want to do is you want to, and I'll show you starting with what I did for 2015. And I wrote out, even though I've been, I've been gardening for longer than that, I finally got wise and started making um, a notebook. And you see here for 2015, this is just my, I did, the, I actually did do this for 2014, but I don't know what happened to that notebook, so I had to start a new one. Um, anyway, I grew a, or I drew a map of my main garden area. And in there, and I drew it in pencil, this is important, pencil, not pen. Um, because when I first, first drew it out, I was planning out what I wanted to do. Not that you can't do it in pen and draw a new map, but then what I did along the way is, is when I decided I, eh, I don't want to do it that way, I'm going to plant this here and there instead. Or I'm going to plant, I'm not going to plant this, I'm going to do something else entirely. And so I'm going to turn this on its side. Now I have several garden areas. This is just my biggest one that's right in the center of the backyard. Um, you can see right here in my sloppy handwriting, I have corn, tar heel beans, and pumpkin. And then along here are my beans and my are other beans and peas. This is the trellis area. This area does not have a trellis. So I was planting all that stuff in amongst each other. So you know the three sisters thing. And I did that I did that in 2015 and it did pretty well. My corn my corn never really got much on it. So but it was still I still got some good stalks and it gave something for the Tar Heel beans to climb on. I got a lot of pumpkin. Um, actually, yeah, I got, I got a lot of pumpkin that year. Um, I got pumpkin the year before, but I got a lot in 2015. And so what I can do is, you know, and then 2016 comes along, I can look at that and go, all right, that's what I did. Do I want to do it that way again? Uh, the corn didn't do that great and I think I don't want to plant since I'm not going to plant that kind of corn I'm not going to do those beans out there because they need something to climb on so I liked those particular beans so I tried in 2016 planting them up here against the trellis instead and then just tried doing the strawberry popcorn which that's another story um, and then instead of and since I didn't do zucchini that year last year I did zucchini and uh Anyway, uh, keeping that mapped out is really important, especially when you're first starting. Now, the one of the things I think is most important, and I'm showing you my notes for 2015, is that anytime you plant anything, you're going to want to put a date of when you planted that. Not just when, but where and how. So, for example, if I've got, um, like on March 30th, I moved the echinacea and basil to the greenhouse. That means I had started it in the house, and then I took the starts and put them in the greenhouse at that time of the year, because I felt it was warm enough to move them out there. Um, and Mar uh, April 1st, I transplanted feverfew into the main garden. Um, and remember, this is 2015. This isn't last year. Uh, I'm just showing you a couple of notes. Um, I planted Amish tomato seed in the ground in the greenhouse 
northwest corner, put mason jars over them. Experiment. I wrote that next to it because it was just an experiment to see what they would do. That experiment was a failure. But you know what? I tried it and I found out. That wasn't the only thing I, the only tomato plants I planted. I was trying a whole bunch of different things with tomatoes that year. Um, moved all my seedlings into the greenhouse on April 2nd. Uh, planted nasturtium seeds that fell from the 2014 plants under the bean trellis and in hanging pots. These are just some of my notes to give you an idea. Um, started lavender seeds on April 13th in a pot in a greenhouse. Worked great. Okay, and moving on, let's see, transplanted on in May on May 3rd, transplanted zucchini zucchini in the west side in West Side Herb Garden. So I have an herb garden on this other side. My main garden's back over here, my herb garden's over here. Well, I have herbs everywhere. <laughs> so it's funny that I call that my herb garden. But I typically am not growing any like vegetables out there. It's mostly herbs and, and uh, flowers and things like that. So let's skip ahead. I took a lot of notes in 2015 and that was very, very helpful for me from 2016. Now, 2016 was when I tried my whole new method of, try, of doing tomato starts. Instead of starting the tomato seed in January or February in the house, and this is the date that I need to know for this year, I waited clear until that first week of March to start my tomato seed. And some of you would go, what? You waited that long? Uh, yeah, I did. I did, and you know what? I had the best success with those plants. And I tried something different in where I didn't start them in the house, I started them in the greenhouse. And um, I'm still gonna do a video on that. I don't wanna give too much of it away, how I did that. I might have said it in a video back this last summer when I was doing a tour of the greenhouse, but uh, I, I kinda wanna save that for another video on what I did. So if you live in a northern, colder climate and you want to try to grow tomatoes without using electricity, um, that might be something you might be interested in. And trust me, I will get to that video when I'm doing it so that, and then get it out right away so that you'll know, okay, this is a good time. You can try what I did as an experiment and see if it works for you. I'm not saying it will. It worked for me. It doesn't mean it will work for you. So again, you got to keep trying what works for you and your area because it's going to be very different from what I do or what somebody else does somewhere else. So don't trust the seed packet. That's why you have to take notes because your seed packets are just going to give you a general rule of thumb. And even if you go to a farmer's al almanac, this is, this is what you plant in your area or even Mother Earth News, great place that's supposed to be specified your, for your area. It's still not for me. There's a lot of that stuff that's still not ideal for my for my little area, my little niche right here. So um, anyway, this date right here, I need to know for this year because I couldn't remember when it was that I did it. And I want to make sure I do it the same this year. And of course the almanac's nice because you can kind of get an idea what your weather patterns are going to be and if there's any differences and you can sort of base it off that too. And that's something that just occurred to me that I should have been writing in this notebook. What was the temperature that day? Um, when was the last freeze that year? And I don't know why I didn't think about that until now, but that's some other really important things that you can put in your notebook because this date may vary if you know, if your the weather was very different, which last year in March, it was pretty much the same. It was the, it was from about April on that it, it, uh, it should, should have been warming up more and it didn't. It stayed very cold and wet most summer long. We only had a few really, you know, regular summer hot days. And I mean, even for our area, it was, it was more few than what's normal. Um, so anyway, you got to have, you got to keep this notebook. And then each year you start, start a new section, take more notes, write out a new map and what you want to do different. As you move along uh, through the years, you may find some, some of the things you won't need to keep track of as much, 
but definitely anytime you start anything new, you try a new variety, you try a new plant altogether, or you try planting in a new area in your in your on your property no matter where it is no matter if you think it's exactly like the other area and the things are going to grow exactly the same chances are it won't you've got to keep trying because that there could be just a slight soil variance there a slight difference in the angle of the sun that can cause things to grow differently not as well or better so you need to write all this stuff down it's going to be very important in the future or even for that year so if you're in, if you're like me, you're gonna you're gonna do a planting of beans this time of the year. Then you're gonna wait two more weeks and you're gonna plant more beans. And then you're gonna wait two more weeks and plant more beans. When you're busy and time is flying by, you know it can be hard to remember when that was. So you've got your notes when you did it. You look back and go, okay, it's already been two weeks since I planted those beans. I want to get I want to get some more beans in the ground. Same thing with your lettuces. Anything where you're doing this continual planting throughout the season. So get those notes, write it down. Yes, it takes a little more extra time, but I tell you what, it's going to save you a lot the next year because then you'll know what worked and what didn't because you've got it written down. And so you'll know to try to do this, do it this way again, don't do it that way, and so on. Okay, so there's that on the garden notebook. That was the main thing I wanted to talk about. The other thing I wanted to say is that anytime you're watching these videos, no matter what they are, from people like us who are trying to share information with you, our information is gonna be limited to our own experiences and, and to our own areas and what we know. We're not the end all, each of us individually, in knowledge of these things. So it is really important to go down and look through those, especially if you have questions on what you heard or saw in the video. Go down and read comments because I guarantee you there's going to be someone who knows a little bit more or a lot more than I do or even Mr. Rain knows and they're going to put in some advice, some suggestions. Um, a lot of the stuff might be stuff that we've heard before but doesn't work for us but some of it's like, oh yeah, I didn't think of that or I didn't know that or whatever. And so there's a lot to be gleaned from the comments from the people that have so much knowledge to share. And, and I get a lot of people that come in and do that on a regular basis. They come in and they're always sharing the information they know. And, and I really appreciate it because I know that these people have more experience in that and they appreciate my videos and I teach them stuff and, and in turn, they give me comments where I can learn from. And so it, it's really a cool community. And so nobody should ever take offense to anyone who wants to add a little bit more knowledge. Just like with my yogurt video, people came in with some, some information I didn't know. There was things I'd actually wondered about, but they, they actually answered questions I had and I was just doing things sort of by the book and then come to find out some of that stuff was unnecessary. And, um, or the peanut butter powder. By people coming in with their comments, it made me realize there were some important things I forgot to say in that video, such as how I store my peanut butter powder. I totally forgot one of the most important things about that. I don't store it in the bags. I don't leave it in the bags and store it in the bags. I put it into jars and then vacuum seal it, mason jars, and vacuum seal it so that will increase the shelf life beyond a single year, like is said, like says it's supposed to be in the bag. Um, now, uh, for me, the peanut butter powder is more for using and baking and making popsicles and pies and things like that. And I thought, I thought it was pretty handy. And, and in a pinch, in a pinch, if you're storing those, the peanut butter in the jars and you've got a long-term situation where you don't have access to the, to real peanut butter, you've got you've got a good replacement for it and that was the uh, that was my other thing that i wanted to say so but read those comments in there because people put some really good information under there that i haven't had a chance to reply back to all of them yet but i have skimmed through some of them and good stuff really good information and you may need to know that before you go stocking up on peanut butter i don't say stock up on anything you know if i say get some peanut butter powder or get this try it first get it and try it don't buy a whole bunch of it because if you absolutely hate it and don't see any you know and you 
don't see uses for it like I find see uses for it, there's no sense in store, stocking up on that. There's going to be something else you're going to want to invest your money in. So, so my main point in, in bringing all that up is don't ignore the comments below the videos. I mean, some of them I'm sure, you know, every, we all get our haters that come in, but I have very few of them. I have some loyal followers that have awesome information, you know. Troll Forge and Bumblebee Junction and Betsy Orman and, um, and just just to name a few. Ellen Fisher. So many of my followers have just a lot of great information. I, those are the names that come to the top of my head, but there's many, many, many others that have given us great information and uh, shared wonderful recipes and ideas. And uh, thank you for that, by the way, people. Really, I do appreciate it. And I love the interaction. I love the community. And it, it's just... It's just cool to be a part of this whole thing. All right, y'all. Thanks for watching. Take care and God bless.